and I am on the ERISA Board of Directors, and I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, if you have just joined, please make sure that you have muted yourself. I'm really excited uh, to be able to introduce you to Danny and Alex. They are with the Palm Beach County Water Utility, and they are one of our eSIG award recipients for 2020. So today they are going to be presenting on their enterprise GIS portal implementation. Please feel free throughout the presentation to type any questions you have in the chat. We will address all of the questions at the end of the presentation following the demo. And again, thank you for, for spending your time. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Danny and Alex. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you guys you know, for making the time to, to spend your afternoon with us. Um, I am Danny Thorpe, the GIS manager, and I'm here with Alex Baker, uh, GIS analyst. Uh, we both are going to go through these, this, this presentation. We have um, here, uh, quite a few slides. So uh, as Wendy uh, mentioned, any question, just make notes, note of it and text it in, um, type it in the chat, and we'll answer those at that point. So Alex. So basically, this is an outline. This is kind of the, the, what we want to cover uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, so we will talk about um, what uh, motivated us to uh, uh, tackle this project and, and what we went through through our, our implementation and then the impact to these changes to our organization and, and lesson learned and future. And then at the very end, you know, we do have a demo, a brief demo. So hopefully you guys can see that, the demo, and, and, and give us some feedback as well. This is just a, a little bit about our organization. Um, we're the third largest um, water and wastewater on uh, utility in, in the state of Florida. Uh, we have uh, approximately 600,000 um, residents that we serve and over 600 employees. Um, there is our, our annual operating budget, $176 million. Um, and we are, we are recognized as an as a industry leader. And we're, we're in the process. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about the, you know, the ISO um, you know, 55,001 certification. We're going to be going for our ISO you know, 55,001 certification in, in, in July. So our organization is decided and we're ready to um, um, get that particular certification. Uh, more on the overview, we have five water treatment plants, um, two wastewater treatment plants, and we have a reclaimed water um, hill facility. Um, and... 930 lift stations throughout our service area. We have one of the largest service area um, in, in, in the state as well. And we have over hundred wells uh, throughout our service areas as well. This is just a graphics to kind of put it in a, um, a perspective. Um, when we look at the total length of uh, linear assets, so that's just kind of give you an idea, um, the, the total length of assets that we have in our service area. So here I kind of wanted to talk about what kind of uh, uh, you know, motivated us to move to um, Portal. Uh, initially for many years, we use Arc Reader. Um, so um, some years ago, we had um, a consultant come in and, and, and take our CAD data and kind of um, you know, rubber sheet it uh, onto a more accurate base that we then in turn um, added to um, ArcGIS. And for years, We've been hey, providing this data to our end users via Arc Reader. So, um, majority of our uh, crews, um, mobile workforce, had Arc Reader locally, and we synchronized those um, laptops um, uh, as needed. Um, the end user had the ability to click on a, an icon on the desktop to actually do that. So, we wanted to shift away from this older technology, and and what we've done is um, with the portal. And the implementation of that, now we're able to provide web maps to our end users. Um, this kind of enabled our organization to access the infrastructure data and web apps and, and also as-built data. So our, our end users are able to get as-built data while they're out in the field. So the, the portal provided a, a user-friendly approach uh, and, and the transitioning from this, this art reader um, application to to the web maps is 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 has been well um, here received by our our operation and maintenance and our mobile workforce. All right, thanks, Danny. Um, as Danny had mentioned, you know the motivation behind getting over to the GIS portal was 
to kind of shift away from static mapping, offline mapping, kind of engage our data a little bit more with our organization. So an example of that is a static map here. You can see static maps have very general overviews of your data. You know, there's no searching on the assets like you can in an interactive web application, you know, limited interactability with the, with the data, limited user experience. Um, it's not dynamic, doesn't read back to the database. Um, so, you know, we found, especially during the past year with the pandemic, having a, a different solution to be able to engage our end users of the importance of the data to be able to interact with it and empower them to get the data in their hands. We kind of wanted to shift away from how we were presenting data in the past using the static map. So seeing that the importance of our utility having spatial awareness, we can see that from a GIS perspective with just general navigation to our assets, um, planning capital improvement projects, forecasting operational costs, maintenance costs, construction costs throughout the utility, modeling potential um, outage impacts on, you know, the most critical infrastructure. If it went down, how many people would be most impacted? How, how critical is our infrastructure in certain areas? What's the risk of, you know, potential outages in certain areas? What, where are we supposed to really be targeting our dollars for um, improving our infrastructure? And of course, hurricane preparation right now, we're in hurricane season and, um, you know, it's definitely important for pre-storm mobilization. I know where all of our assets are in the event of an emergency uh, like a hurricane. So the solution that we, you know, chose to best disseminate our GIS data throughout our organization and empower our end users to utilize, you know, the data was the GIS enterprise portal through um, means of the ease of use, um, you know, the organization of the content, being able to search through it and filter through web apps and maps, and most importantly, the dynamic data access to have the data always, as it's changing in the database, be reflected in the, in the, in the web applications in real time without having to do any physical synchronizations like what was done in the past. Okay. So um, we kind of, you know, broke it down into three phases. Um, for the implementation, we had a first phase, which was essentially our ex exploratory discovery phase, the second phase for the system development implementation part of it. And really kind of like, you know, the most, one of the most important phases, the third one was to kind of roll it out, train our staff, plant the seed on how important this technology is to help them out within the organization and take advantage of GIS. Um, so this exploratory discovery phase, it was a kind of a two-year process from, um, you know, conception to final rollout. We had um, several meetings with ESRI. We have the EEAP program that um, we have with ESRI um, that kind of helped us out with laying out best practices um, before we laid out and, and went out on this endeavor to stand up an enterprise portal, we kind of wanted to make sure we were following all those, those best practices. Um, so, um, and also too, I just wanted to add, as we went through that process with, with Esri, um, at the time it was called EAP, we also wanted to not just hire someone to come in and build out our environment. So we, we worked closely with, with Esri, we kind of just, uh, um, they just basically helped us do it ourselves. So we wanted to, to, and you you at the end of that process, have the skill set so that we can maintain it if there was any issues. Absolutely. So um, with that phase, we have the system development. So our utility has over 600 employees. So that helped our infrastructure IT department to help size dedicated servers based on what the expected utilization would be. Um, you know, Danny, thought it was definitely important to have a highly available environment. You know, in their case, there's a server that's down. So we went with two portal machines. Um, yeah, right also, here, yeah. yeah, also too, I wanted to add, and uh, also too for you folks that are <laughs> that are watching the presentation, uh, you know, typically Esri, you know, to implement the, the, um, 
the, the portal with um, you know, web adapters. So we, we opted not to use web adapters because we had a low balancer. So I'm, I'm just, uh, we went with a low balancer because we thought we was going to use a low balancer anyway, but then, then to have the web adapters there as well, we thought that was another point of failure. So we asked Esri, do we truly need the web adapters? And they say, really, you don't really need them because we had a low balancer that's going to um, um, balance that load. So we opted to not use not use the web adapter. So if anyone has any input later in the question sec section of the uh, meeting, I'll, I'll like to hear, hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we kind of considered this uh, webinar, you know, opportunity for us to kind of give insight to everybody listening in on this, Correct. but also, you know, an opportunity for us to learn from who, whoever is listening in on this and has some, you know, additional feedback that could help us improve some of our workloads as well. So going back to our system resources, we have, um, you know, the two portal machines, the two GIS, our GIS servers that are federated with the portal. And, um, you know, we also utilize Geo event server to track some of our AVLs throughout the utility on the vehicle tracking. And um, yeah, like Danny had mentioned, we use the load balancer um, instead of fully utilizing the web adapter. So just a little uh, general overview of the implementation. You know, we went through the configuration and testing of the environment, uh, installing the software, migrating to the new environment, the new ArcGIS server, 10.6 environment, um, configuring all the GIS applications, and most importantly, identifying all the end, end user um, needs to take advantage of the technology. So the bones to the, the portal, enterprise portal environment is your, your services kind of feeding into that. That's what all your map services um, are, all your web maps are feeding off of that are feeding into your application. So, we kind of currently have a mix between publishing from ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro. I know with 10.9, we're going to be doing everything through Pro. So we're kind of in a, a mixed phase now, porting all of our services from ArcGIS Pro. Um, so publishing out the content was critical, you know, getting everything um, with your symbology set, extends, fields to include, exclude. Um, you know, determining what we wanted to host on the enterprise and what we wanted to have dynamically changing back in the database was, was important. Like, you know, we have numerous boundary layers that don't necessarily change all that much. So we didn't really see a benefit on performance to having it hit our database consistently. And with that too, we also created a, a publishing database for, for, for performance. So we're not editing directly to the publishing database, we were, you know, considering performance there also. Once you have all your services published in the environment, um, obviously you create your web maps. From that, um, you know, with the targeted web maps that the organization kind of wants to see, um, setting your arcade expressions that create these virtual fields that we don't house in our database, but we take advantage of in applications for hyperlinking to our property appraiser website for each property uh, within our utility. Uh, we have custom expressions for serving up our unique identifiers also in our applications. And once we have all you know, our web maps created, we create our targeted applications from these web, web maps. Um, and the primary tool that we use within the enterprise portal right now is Web App Builder um, for most of our applications at the moment. In the future, we're looking for utilizing Experience Builder, but that's one of our future uh, you know, improvements that we're going to take advantage of. So lastly, we have the training and rollout phase. This was really important. We were lucky and fortunate enough here in the organization. We, we've identified you know, a, a plethora of power users within each division. And we took upon ourselves to target those power users and, and do some targeted training for them specialized before we did an initial major rollout to the whole organization to get their feedback on some of the applications that we were developing for each, each department. Um, so we had power users from engineering, power users from the lab, power users from regulatory compliance, all looking at you know, the applications that we were gonna push out before we shared it out to the entire organization. And then you know, having 
the safety meetings, that was huge. It was an opportunity for us to present there and get a large portion of the utility all in one room to where we could kind of plant the seed on how they could transition to this web GIS portal and take advantage of the maps in these safety meetings. So they could, wow, you know, get their hands dirty, take advantage of it, and then provide us that valuable feedback before we shot it out to the whole organization for use. Um, so yeah, once, once we did the training and rollout, it was pretty cool. You know, we had like a huge impact on the organization. We, we, we noticed that their different departments saw the value in it and that kind of trickled interest in different, different agencies. You know, our organization's heavily leaning on asset management, um, right now. And so that's, that's a definitely a valuable, um, resource GIS wise for an asset management team. And, and one um, of the, you know, uh, another impact went to our IT department um, prior to the portal, as I mentioned, we have the um, dark reader product and, and that was a major uh, management um, task when we needed to update these laptops. And when the new version of, of Esri came out, we had to go to each laptop and, and update our reader and also synchronize um, the data, static data. So this, you know, that was a major impact for us as well. Absolutely. Just going to the portal. Yep, absolutely. So um, just looking at this, uh, I'm gonna be going through each one, uh, operation and maintenance, they use it heavily lab, contract management, engineering, regulatory compliance. One of the, the major players, uh, operation and maintenance. Um, you know, they, they use this 24 seven, uh, when they have to go to a main break or they have to look up an asset, they have to navigate anywhere to a work order um, and have a unique identifier to go to a hydrant to perform any kind of maintenance. This is kind of the go-to map for the entire utility also, just for general navigation. And then you can see on the right, you know, we have a valve exercising program where they want to keep track of which valves have been exercised and they can kind of see that through work order status from our asset management software, visualizing and tracking how that work is being done through through space and the portal dashboard web map. Yeah, and we have also you know, integrated with other you know, business systems, as Alex mentioned, um, the, the map to the right is getting data from our Maximo um, work order management system. And then we have the, the lab works uh, for our laboratory, SCADA. So we're uh, integrated with all of those applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Maximo is the asset management software that our organization takes advantage of to manage and track work against our assets. And, you know, all the enterprise portal map services that we have published in the new environment are all consumed within this Maximo environment. So they rely heavily on the, on the portal environment for consuming the map services that reside. And, and there's also a workflow as well when it comes to our asset management Maximo. Uh, we maintain the, the access, I mean, the assets in GIS. So when new assets are coming into our organization through as built, we add that into um, a GIS environment. And then there's a process that, that creates these assets behind the scenes at Maximo, assign asset numbers and all of the pertinent information to keep them in sync. Mm -hmm. Next, we got the laboratory. They have um, bi-weekly water distribution sampling efforts that they, they conduct routinely and to effectively visualize that data, they can go through and see through time how their sample data has changed um, week, week by week, and then also generate these charts for each sample location of how that data has fluctuated through time as well. So it's no longer looking through PDF maps, Excel spreadsheets, you can chart all of this right through a map, search a sample location, zoom to it, look at the different parameters from the laboratory database through space, through time, see how it changes, make correlations on if work was done in a particular area, why different parameters are, are changing certain times. So it's uh, been a pretty valuable tool for the laboratory and kind of explore their data even a little bit further through space. Um, contract management, this is a revenue generating agency. And they get a lot of calls from the public on, you know, if they're in our service area or who's the provider. We have adjacent utilities on this map that they can 
search and address. If they're an adjacent utility, it has the contact information for that agency and um, helps out a lot with developer projects as well. So new connections into our service area, they use this map to kind of pinpoint where new hookups can exist. Um, it's a more of a targeted tool where they don't necessarily need to see all of the layers by default that we have published in our GIS. They kind of want to see generally our service area um, and then some of our infrastructure in our, in our meter route. So it's primarily for them a research tool um, that they, they find definitely some use, use for. Um, and then the big player for our agency is engineering. I mean, they use it heavily to access as build drawings, track their capital um, improvement project boundaries, statuses of them. We've targeted the power users within engineering to kind of take more ownership of their data and create these editor applications where they can draw in the boundaries of their CIP and plan review projects and maintain the status through the portal application without GIS having to play any role in maintaining that, that information. So we're kind of passing the torch over on ownership to the managers essentially in engineering to maintain their projects in GIS. And, and, and that's one of our goals as well to try to, we're trying to create more of a self-service um, uh, in our organization. Uh, here we get a lot of requests, especially from our engineering department. So we're trying to develop um, tools so that they can serve themselves. So, I mean, that's some of our, our goals um, you know, moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's great that when they can change a status to complete that it goes to an in inactive layer in the infrastructure portal application so that they can, any, anyone else in the organization can see, oh, okay, now that CIP project is complete. Um, and then if they want, they can see who's the project manager and, and, and stuff like that. So it's not just CIP and plan review projects that can be edited. Um, you know, we have other data that we empower the engineering staff to maintain and to take ownership over with uh, the delineating where flow meters are, are put in temporarily throughout the utility and um, to extrapolate consumption data from our meters. Uh, they can actually draw in on these uh, district service boundaries, extract meter information and then put through another third party application charting out consumption information which we want to be able to do directly from the portal in a future update using insights but it's still amazing that they're able to just you know go through and take ownership of the data see where the flow meters exist because we don't have a necessarily a system of record for the flow meters they're changing on the fly and, and they know best where where they're placed out in the field goes for another tool engineering uses for proposed valves. We put an editor application in front of operation and maintenance staff and engineering staff, and they went through with their institutional knowledge and put in where they best thought proposed water valves can go within our utility uh, for consultants to look at, for management to look at, for other engineers to look at, to make better judgments on some of our uh, future evaluation projects that are gonna move forward on the sewer and water side. And you can see the editor application on the, on the bottom right there. So um, with that too, speaking on proposed water valves, that kind of all comes in together with layering, uh, you know, our criticality data. We have criticality outputs for consequence of failure, likelihood of failure for our mains that are created for our sewer and water side. So we have water specific and source specific improvement applications that kind of culminate all the criticality data into its own map with on top of our customer service database, we have a complaint call um, table that's geocoded that represents where break history in the past 20 years exists and where we can kind of prioritize work and, and look at where our most critical infrastructure is on a utility side to kind of help determine where to best allocate dollars yeah, for future exactly. projects. And uh, also I wanted to add like these maps, um, you know, the data was was created in Info Water and Info Asset Planner, uh, which is modeling tools. And, and, and basically those tools are primarily being used by our engineers primarily. So we thought it was a good idea to take some of that output and publish that data to a web map 
so that anyone um, throughout our organization would, would have access to that, um, to all of that data and, and, and information. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's just, we're just trying to make sure all the data that we have internally, we just want to make sure that we can provide as much as possible to our um, organization so anyone can have access. Yep. With the um, adding on to that, the Grant and that software we also use, you know, we want to pull that in. So we've been able to join back over to our Grant and Net inspection database and pull in, um, you know, inspection records so we can on the fly see where gravity main has been lined, where gravity mains have been inspected, where manholes have been inspected, and then also get to some of the observational data where lateral lines have been placed, um, you know, footage of line pipe and then accessing the actual inspection videos as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that as well, just to give you a little bit of a background, what's happening in the background, we, uh, we use Granite Net and to get that data over into GIS, we have a process where we, where we do a, a synchronization and we're using um, you know, linear referencing. So not only the data is coming in from Granite, we're using uh, the linear referencing so we can see all of the you know, defects as, as recorded during the inspection. So the end user will, will have access to see this on the actual um, um, web map currently right now. And in the past, to, you know, to get to this content, you had to use um, your, your grant and net to um, see it, which is a licensed product. Um, publishing this in the web environment may be easier for anyone in the organization to, to access the content. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this is kind of a newer thing. We just showed our INI team this, this afternoon. Right. And they were, you know, it, you could see their, their minds kind of, you know, running on what more they could add to the application, you know, so they're going to get this, I think, later on in the week, next week, and they're going to come back to us with feedback, feedback to where we can improve it even further, because this is kind of what we kind of brainstormed in house of what we foresee them wanting to, to, to see in an application. Yeah. But, you know, once they get it in their hands, we'll definitely have that valuable feedback. Um, and I think this is one of the last divisions that we're going to talk about regulatory compliance. They're responsible for, you know, our uh, health and safety plans. This is another division where they're drawing in these boundaries, these uh, health and safety plan boundaries, which are mandated by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to help delineate where contaminated soils exist. So if you're doing under, any uh, underground utility work in that area, there's supposed to be a, um, you know, a, a health and safety plan. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's been valuable because if um, being on the map and the guide, the operation maintenance staff, they, they would know that they would have to wear the, um, you know, the, the proper protective gear. So having this, this, this data on the map is, is, has been valuable for our organization. Yeah. And just another example of another department taking ownership over the data. Exactly. We're not having to maintain this in GIS, it's just them drawing it through a web application, running back to the database. Right. Um, and then, you know, we're in hurricane season. We're two weeks in hurricane season right now. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate. We've had some close calls in the last five years. You know, we've had our EOC activated here. And uh, it's, been, it's, it's been really close. So yeah. as a first responder agency during storms, you know, the portal environment has helped tremendously with, you know, pre-storm mobilization of our lift station generators, knowing where they're at, and, um, assessing our infrastructure before hurricane season starts to where we can, you know, determine where we can harden our infrastructure if needed with uh, generator placement. So um, just goes back to spatial awareness. Um, we have a critical facilities application that's used. It's also, you know, shows us where our critical infrastructure is with where our water treatment plants are, production wells, and not just our critical infrastructure, but critical infrastructure that we also serve, like hospitals, schools, shelters, dialysis centers, and nursing homes. So they all have an FPNL account or, or utility uh, account information for that. So when there's a power outage, we can help best prioritize, extrapolate those account numbers, and best communicate back to our power utility, the account numbers to prioritize power restoration efforts. So it's a, it's a, it's a, just a good tool um, in general for, for emergencies and, you know, showing where our highest impact lift stations exist, who, 
you know, how, where, where the, if they have fixed generators or not, uh, where the biggest impacts on outages will exist. And then looking back into our work order management system, you know, actively where our skid generators are associated to different lift stations and which lift stations have a trailer associated with them. So definitely a, a, a key for emergency response and situational awareness. Um, and then tying, tying into that with power outage, identification, you know, integrating with our SCADA system, uh, we have a, uh, you know, a stored procedure that runs every four minutes that represents the last status of um, our, our uh, telemetry antenna at a particular site um, that's reading off the alarm status, the wastewater level at a particular pump station, if there's a communication loss, if there's a power loss status thrown. So again, we can see if there's major power outages happening in certain areas, you know, what's the cause of it? We can better respond to, to these situations. Yeah, and I also wanted to add to that. Um, we also have um, GeoAdvan and all of our mobile, you know, generators have ADL. So moving forward, um, even in this hurricane season, we do want to implement a GeoAdvan to track um, the location of our generators. Typically, in a major event like a hurricane, there's tons of power outages. So we don't have a, a lift station, I mean, a generator for each lift station. So these, these generators have to be moved around throughout the service area. So we're intending to use GeoAdvant and, and that tool to help manage you know, the location of where the generators are and, and when, when to fuel them up as well. So, yep. And then just going back to using the portal, you know, to empower your end users. We're in this uh, year of a pandemic where you're having Zoom meetings and it's not necessarily uh, practical to pull up a PDF and be zooming in and out on a PDF through a Zoom meeting. Um, so, you know, we're giving targeted web maps out to uh, end That's users right. when they're conducting even in-person meetings in a conference room, it's way more interactive. This example on the left shows a Hydra candidate web map to show exactly where your deficiencies are with hydro replacement and utility, the magenta lines are showing our water main that don't intersect, hydrant laterals, and then the yellow firefly symbology shows where we have hydrants existing. So you can kind of just at a high level see where you know, we, we can we definitely have some, some projects to uh, install some new hydrants. And then on the right, we have just a quick overview of showing where our highest impact um, sewer valves are, where we want to probably send out more than just a one person to exercise this valve. This is if there's something that's gonna happen during an exercise at one of these valves, you know, we're gonna want a, a good team of uh, individuals there to exercise because uh, it's gonna have a great impact if something goes wrong and we're gonna to have to have a good crew there to kind of mitigate it if anything goes wrong. So we have dashboards also, aside from those targeted applications, we have, you know, uh, grant and net dashboards to kind of, um, put together our total line pipe and total uh, taps that go into our um, lift stations. So we can forecast costs for contractors who are gonna be doing lining work on what's already been done, what work's been conducted. Internal staff uses dashboards to track our internal projects. We have a realignment project where we've gone through and edited our infrastructure, QA, QC'd it. And um, it gives an opportunity for Danny to review and see, hey, where are we? to quickly report to management on the status of different projects that are happening. Yeah, we got final on this one. Okay, and then with that, we have our summary dashboard that kind of shows a high level of the footage of main number of assets that we have throughout the utility. Um, so the organizational impact is, is vast, you know, with over 600 active users. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak on that we no longer have to update the computers. Yeah, I, I kind of mentioned that earlier um, as we as we transition to the portal, um, just uh, the, the, the impact from not having to have an IT staff to kind of maintain um, those mobile devices. Just um, we technically what we've done is we've had the GIS data set and all of our ASBA imagery is all static. That was the way that we provided maps to our organization, our mobile workforce, is everybody has static maps. So now with the portal, you know, we've been able to um, not use that process as our primary map source. Yeah. So, um, 
in kind of closing, there's a couple more slides left. You know, we've noticed there's uh, definitely an improvement to productivity and it all stems from empowering our end users, getting our organization GIS ready to be able to put the GIS into their hands to, you know, play with the data, plant the seed, give them ideas and give us feedback on how they can best utilize it once they get familiar and comfortable with using and um, playing with the portal maps and applications that we give them. So, you know, we just wanna support a culture of spatial awareness throughout our organization and, and, and put the GIS in as many people's hands as we can and using the GIS portal does all of that for us. Um, the lessons learned through this implementation, we had an opportunity from a GIS perspective to learn more on how to configure security certificates and uh, more on the IT realm of things with uh, utilizing LDAP technology to manage the enterprise account usernames. Um, looking through this presentation on the applications, we're like, oh, well, you know, it's definitely important to have uh, SOPs and documentations for all of your applications, you know, because it can grow, it can grow big. And, you know, you definitely want to have the documentation in place to, to know who, who the target users are for these applications and kind of the backend configurations and what services are being used, what databases are being used and all that. So that's definitely important. And to uh, also not lose sight of the quality assurance and quality control aspect of your, your databases, because, you know, you can make all the, the prettiest maps and the coolest looking applications, but if your GIS data isn't there and, you know, checked and accurate, then, you know, your data, your applications are only going to be as good as, as the data. And you, and you want a lot of trust from the organization on the data that they're using within, within their maps. And, that, and, and not only that, too, um, working in the utility and having a large uh, mobile workforce, it's important that our end user have, have the confidence in that data that they're using on, on the day to day. So it's one, it's one of the things that we we focus on maintaining that quality so that our our um, organization can could trust in um, the data that we provide. Yep, absolutely. You know, we eventually don't want to have the as built right. accessible in the application, the the system or record. You're looking at the GIS, and that should be exactly how the as built and the GPS data reflects it. So, um, some future updates. Uh, once we go through the process and upgrading our portal at 10.8, we're currently at 10.6.1. There's some additional functionality that we anticipate to take advantage of when we go to 10.8.1. Uh, some of those include the isolation trace widget that's in, uh, available in portal at 10.8.1. Uh, we currently have that configured in ArcGIS Online, but it, it's, it's going to be nice to have that just out of the box functionality in 10.8.1 and utilize Experience Builder for additional customization on our applications. Um, we're moving this year to uh, the utility network, hopefully in a test environment, and that's definitely going to be the, the future in the next uh, you know few six years. Months, you know, six months to twelve months. You know, redlining functionality, communicating from the field to the, the the office on what can be changed as they observe stuff in the field to communicate back to us in the office to improve our data and then um, incorporating insights. Um, you know, we do have insights. So moving forward, we, we definitely want to take advantage of that product as well um, to provide more information to our end user as well. Absolutely. So with that, I think we're going to... We have a brief demo. We want to leave time you know, for questions. So I think Alex is going to spend maybe about five minutes just kind of showing you guys a couple of things that he talked about. So just to show, this is our homepage of our organization. Um, we have a few applications up here on a tab. That's out of the way. Um, Alex, we are still seeing the slide for the demo. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know that. How about now? Here we go. Yep. Um, I see the page that has the Palm Beach County Water Utility GIS org page. Gotcha. Yes. That's where okay. we want to be. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so this is our homepage. We have our top used applications that are right here on the front end. Users can go in and search by, um, you know, the different tags we have associated and filter by the applications on the top right and search through our organization and what we have available. Um, you know, one of the applications we kind of wanted to demo was our 
infrastructure summary dashboard where we consistently get uh, requests from staff from all over the organization on footage of pipe in a particular zone. So they can go here and click on an administrative boundary and see the total number of hydrants we have, the total linear pipe uh, for water main, gravity main, force main, um, gravity main lined. You can get percentages of the material types broken down. It's all filtered based on the zone that's selected up here. Uh, and then you can kind of chart through the, the, the force main diameters. Um, you know, there's no reclaimed in this particular zone. We have different charts for the, the main diameter broken down. Um, so it's a nice interactive tool. You can go through and see it broken down by zones. Um, Isolation valves broken down by diameter. So, you know, it's just a different way to visualize your data and summarize it um, and quickly access it. Once we, you know, have this configured, we kind of steer a lot of people to look at this first. If they can get the numbers that they want, then um, they're usually pretty happy with that application. This is the, um, Sampling application here, we have our sampling data that we can visualize through time. We can go through the weeks and see how the data kind of breeds through time using this application um, every week, how, how it's changing. Looking at charts, we can uh, use a spatial filter here to look at a particular um, sample location. And then go ahead and chart out the last six months for the results at that one site. So that gives the lab, that gives upper management, that gives engineering staff an opportunity to kind of engage with the data a little bit more. We have the sewer summary dashboard that we just presented to the I and I team, and that gives you kind of like different totals for what we have currently in our infrastructure for different lift station boundaries on the total counts of manholes, total amount of line pipe, and the total number of gravity main. And this is used for forecasting costs to contractors when they're gonna be tackling lateral lining projects for different lift station basins. They can go here and see how many lateral taps are within a particular lift station. If it's been inspected in Granite Net, because this information is coming from Granite Net. And um, just kind of get an idea of how many more manholes need to be inspected when they're gauging work for, for different lift stations. Yeah, and this is dynamic too. So this will change based on what lift station you're at. So it'll zoom you to another lift station and update the results on what's been inspected, how much has been lined, uh, how many lateral taps we have from Grand and Net in that particular lift station. So um, as you can see, we have quite a bit of lift stations. So um, it's a pretty cool tool that the INI team can utilize. And then with that too, we have inspection videos also that are collected with the Granonet um, inspection information that we can associate from virtual directories <clears throat> and open up straight from a map. So on our pop-ups, we can show related content and open up the video for a particular asset, which is pretty cool, which they, they really liked. Um, to give them just the, another level to look at the, the media that's collected. So with that, I think that's gonna open it up for questions. We just wanted to touch on just a, a few of the applications. Um, so if anybody uh, has questions, I think Wendy is gonna be organizing that. Yep, so we do have a couple of questions in the chat. The first is from Jordan, and they want to know, are desktop users performing service-based edits, or is the SDE being edited directly? Oh, we're editing our enterprise um, from our GIS staff directly, but yeah. Our engineering department and um, country, what other department is creating boundaries? Yeah, our regulatory compliance and, and engineering, they, they're editing through feature services, um, actually against a different database. So they're, they're editing against a, a totally separate uh, enterprise database than what we're editing in 
GIS from our, our staff. Yes, yeah, so they are doing edits, but it's mainly um, creating boundaries. Yeah, so and, so. and they're not doing it through desktop editor application. Yeah. I mean, they're doing it through the web, through a web browser, um, through like um, those editor applications that we were showing before. That's great. Uh, Kendall mentions that they also use GraniteNet and they're wondering how you're storing the videos so that they're hyperlinked in portal. So, so basically in, in the process of, of, of um, doing that synchronization, we went through the process of creating a model, we run a model that takes data out of granite and then writes it to a, a geo database. And, and, and part of that data that's being written to the geo databases, it also have a, a column with the references where the videos are. So we just, in GIS, we just um, turned that layer, that field into a hyperlink field, and that's how we're able to get that data. So in Granite, that information is stored where the videos are. So when you export it out, that path comes with it. Yep. And that's just the virtual directory that's the virtual. created then to that share folder where the videos yeah. are. Yeah, that's a good point. We did create a, a, a virtual you know, directory so that our web map can hit it and, 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 and play those videos. Excellent. Uh, another question from Kendall. Did you include any utility network migration as part of your enterprise deployment, or is that planned for the future? That's planned for the future. Um, we have um, engaged in Azure again uh, with some other things helping us with our, our implementation. Uh, we are talking to them uh, in regards to you know, utility network as well. So we just at the, um, you know, the infancy stage of looking at the utility network and planning this process. I think we're at a point right now is we kind of want someone to kind of take a look at our, our, our data and kind of kind of um, um, guide us in essence, like what things we need to improve. But currently we did not um, plan or include any of that in our, in our initial portal implementation. Yeah. So that is to come. That's going to be, that's going to be a fun one. Yeah. We're all, we're all, we're all looking forward to that. Internally, um, you as a staff, you know, we're trying to learn what we can with, with the utility network. There's a lot of um, um, webinars out there, so we try to sit in as, as many of those as we can so that we can kind of um, you know, educate ourselves so that we're better prepared yeah. when, we, when we start to engage uh, yeah. your contractors. And some of those preliminary discussions that we've had with the utility network migrating towards it, it's you know, kind of come to the realization that we're going to have to have both data models in, in a around. sense for a little while just living together because we have a lot of third party integrations with the, with the GIS. So it's not like an abrupt thing that you can right. kind of just switch over. There's going to be there's a lot of migratory tools. Yeah, the schema change is huge. And with us, you know, uh, integrating with Maximo and some other tools, it's going to take a little while. But yeah, this, this current year, our goal is to do a pilot and then start that process. That's great. A uh, question from Curtis. Are your mini apps and dashboards all mobile friendly? Yeah. Yes. They yeah, are. they are mobile friendly. Yep. And then uh, another question from Curtis. Uh, completely relate to putting the editing into the hands of the business experts versus GIS staff. However, do you worry about incorrect geometry edits leading to incorrect decisions? Currently, right now, um, the, the, the infrastructure, our assets that matter most to us, like our, our utility infrastructure, our end users don't edit that, all, only the GIS staff. So yeah. we're creating other tools for them to do uh, other things. Right now, we, we started that process currently with, with boundaries. And as Alex mentioned too, with our, our, our valve location, with engineering operation and maintenance, we're allowing them to drop points on the map. But no one um, outside of um, the GIS staff is, is editing our infrastructure. And, and um, that's something we'll have to address in the future because I know it's one of these things that for us, uh, especially with our maximum integration, we will like to end user to have maybe a little bit more control when it comes to the attributes. For example, um, taking a, a you know, fire hydrant out of service or a valve status open and close. Those are the things that we'll probably start first as it becomes, I mean, as we approach this, this um, staff, like editing the data, it's probably started at the attribute level first. Yeah. Okay, and I actually have a question. Um, Alex, I noticed when you were sharing the infrastructure summary dashboard, uh -huh. right in the middle, there was a link to a training video. And oh, I was yeah. just curious about what content, was it a, a training video for the dashboard itself or some of your other yes, uh, business practices? It's actually a, a training video that our uh, 
public relations department put together. They, they did a really good job with um, creating training videos for how to use uh, some of our GPS units. And then also for some of our applications for how to navigate the application on how to use the widgets and how to navigate to it from our SharePoint site for end users to kind of get that, you know, high level training before they call GIS. To say, right. how, how do you use this? You know, this. And I think another intent was uh, we have a, a, a range of users, some users are more technical and some are not. So, yeah. so some of those users that are more technical that didn't want to really sit in a class training, they can click on a video and learn it in, in, in a few minutes. Yeah, we were, we were fortunate to have a really good um, public relations is, specialist yeah. that had a, had a great voice and made great videos um, to kind of show you how to use the application so we can just tuck there on the app as a hyperlink. Yeah, I definitely, and lots of conversations that I'm having with uh, other professionals out there in the field, that, that's a huge trend going towards uh, getting those recordings and getting them out there so that, you know, the, the team, they're seeing a lot bigger adoption. And plus, just as you have turnover, you grow and you hire more people. It's one way to, you know, get them using the information, the data very quickly and, and getting them comfortable doing that. Um, that is all the questions we had in the chat. Are there any other additional questions from anybody today? Nope. All right. Well, Alex and Danny, we really appreciate you joining us and uh, presenting on all the great work that y'all are doing. And again, congratulations on the eSig award. And I'm hopefully looking forward to seeing y'all in a couple of months. Yeah, and I, I also would like to thank everyone again for, for sitting in on our presentation. Also would like to, uh, to thank uh, hey, Eurissa and the Zagner you know, committee for, for uh, hey, selecting us. So we're, we're definitely uh, honored and we look forward to doing more in the future and hopefully in the near future, we'll apply for another award. Great, and did y'all have a slide that had your contact information on it? Maybe we can put that up for a few seconds. So if anybody yeah, has was, any. Uh, I think that was on the first slide. This is right there. Too. Oh, it was on the, the last slide. It was on the very last slide. Let's go back. Sorry. Right. Yeah, we are open. If anyone have any um, questions that they want to email us or talk to us about, I, I, I know that I presented at the beginning about the web adapter. Um, I am curious if, if, if people are, strictly using web adapters or they go yeah. with more of a load balancer. So I'm just curious what, what other folks are doing. Yep. If anybody's watching this reporting later too, who want to reach out to Danny and myself, you know, we're always open to learning more new things also. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy, as well right. for uh, narrating for us as well. Absolutely. Well, I hope everybody has a good uh, rest of your day and evening and, uh, Registration is open for GIS Pro in Baltimore later this year and definitely be uh, checking out the URISA website for other events. We do have uh, several GIS Leadership Academies coming up this year that will be in person in Portland, in St. Pete, and Wendy, I'm sorry, I forget the last location, um, but Min all the information- Minneapolis. <laughs> Minneapolis, that's right. But all the information is on the URISA website. So if you're interested in attending any of those, go make sure that you register before it fills up. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good afternoon.